All righty, we're live. How's it going? Very good, you? Good, good. So, all right, we're on the seventh episode of the Cheyenne Show. I'm very excited because, you know, I got a politician to come on the show, a uh, man of many talents. You're also a magician, too. <laughs> and yeah. his name is Matthew yeah. Kaminsky. Yeah. So let's get into it. Awesome. I'm down. The Cheyenne Show. Uh, for whatever reason, I'm having a hard time hearing you after that intro, but I still managed to to read uh, your lips. So, um, so yeah, my name is Matthew Kaminsky. Um, I was a federal candidate in the 2021 elections, um, the SNAP election that was called by Justin Trudeau. I've also uh, participated in municipal politics, and I was also a provincial candidate in the last Quebec uh, provincial election, which was nice. Um, I'm also a CPA student on the side, and I work as a, an external auditor uh, at a uh, big four uh, accounting firm. Awesome. So you, you, you're man in who's, like, do you do a lot of consultant there? I mean, you're an auditor, so you're definitely into the finance aspect of, uh, you know, politics and everything like that too, right? Exactly. So, I mean... I um I audit I've audited um public companies as well as private companies. I've seen a wide range of different uh, companies in different industries and how they operate. I also think that um accounting uh, serves as a great way to like understand how how personal finances work as well as companies and and their mindset of how they go about their uh, daily operations. I, I think that served me well in politics uh just you know being able to understand what happens on the outside but the inside as well. So for the viewers that don't know, you ran against a pretty, um, you know, high profile Mark Garneau. Um, yeah. And people knew him. He, he, I think he, he's very popular. He served how many terms in West Rock? So, I mean, he, uh, he's been there now. I believe he won his third uh, election when it was in, 20, um, in 2021. So I think he's been there now, I would say probably close to, uh, I think, eight years seven years. It's wow. as long as Justin Trudeau has been around, he's been around. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, like, you know, he's a pretty popular guy with uh, the people in Westmont. Um, I honestly like, you know, when you, cause like, it was very like mind boggling for me that someone as young as you was running against like a older guy like that. Who's, you know, very popular. So definitely kudos. It was like a, it was a sign of like, okay, like the young people, you know, they're moving. They're not just settling for like old guys uh, running politics. No, for sure. And when I decided to run, I had three weeks because I wasn't planning on running. Um, I was asked by the party um, if I'd like to run to, to be given this opportunity. And um, I said to myself, what do I have to lose? I only have three weeks. Um, obviously, NDG Westmount is a very, it's a liberal stronghold uh, on the island of Montreal. It's uh, one of the strongest liberally held seats on the island. So um, I knew that going in, but what I was just attempting to do was find a way to um, chip away a little bit at the liberal support. And what I managed to do is get a higher proportion of votes and get more votes than my last um, conservative, the last conservative candidate that was there. And I only had three weeks and I only had a 50th the budget and I only had about a 50th the volunteer base. So between all those facts, I, I think it was a pretty successful run. signs yourself and uh you know you're asking people to help out volunteer so it seemed like it was very grassroots oh exactly i mean it came down to family and friends at the end of the day right that was that was helping me uh because not many people it's not the same as a regular election where you have a couple months to prepare you know the stages of the election how it's going to go down this is just like five weeks out trudeau was like let's let's hold an election and then from there it's like oh let's find all of our candidates now the ones that haven't uh confirmed and then from there you got to build a team you got to build a strategy and then implement that strategy all within i think at the time it was three weeks and just a few days for me so um yeah it was, it was definitely crazy can you tell me a little bit about how that strategy works like because i mean going in three weeks it's not a lot of time to get prepared what do you what are the main important things that you look at when you want to go campaign against a guy like mark garneau so i mean the idea like now in hindsight, I can say the idea wasn't to win. The idea was to 
really just chip away at support. And I also leveraged that with my NDP um, fellow candidate that was there. Like we, her and I had a conversation at one point and we said, if we can just really chip away at what's going on here, then it will be a success for the both of us because we both have a lot to gain from the liberals failing at their mandate. So what it entails is seeing how much money you have at the beginning, seeing the expenses that, um, you know, cover signs, cover your, you know, basic snacks for your volunteers, um, covering if you want to advertise on the radio or in local uh, publishings, stuff like that. And then just allocating your budget and then also just allocating your time per day. Like me, I, I had to request an excusal from work, uh, like an unpaid leave from work because um, they cannot have a registered employee also voicing political opinions because then it could get conflated that the firm that I work for could be echoing the same political opinions that I have, even though that they don't have those opinions. So I needed to like basically see how much time I had, made sure that it was enough to give a full campaign and then allocate it based on the money that I had. So it becomes just like a, how well can you organize your schedule type of thing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Cause I mean, you were at an accounting firm, right? Exactly. So literally, uh, the, uh, the Conservative Party of Canada reached out to me, I believe it was on a Thursday morning. And they were like, hey, do you want to be our candidate? And then I was looking at the file that I was working on at work. And I was like, oh, I finished the file tomorrow. And I'm actually finishing my work relatively early. So I went to the partner of the file I was working on. And I said, hey, can we just can, can we have a private meeting for like just five minutes so I can ask you a question? So um, we went into, uh, uh, I think it was a Zoom or a Teams chat, and I said, how would you feel about me finishing the file early, taking off work and running for the federal elections? And um, everyone was very well received to it, uh, well received to it, excuse me, and uh, they were like, go for it. Uh, so they, they brought me to the HR reps at work. HR filled out an unpaid leave form for me. They told me, good luck. And uh, if, if you win, we'll, you know, we're, we'll support you. And if you lose, well, we'll see you back at work whenever uh, you want to come back. Well, that's awesome that they just, you know, they're, they're supportive like that. And they, didn't, they weren't like, it's either the job or, you know, politics. Well, yeah. And a part of me didn't know, right? Because you work for like a pretty big company and they, they, they do ask you, which party are you running for? And you just never know who that HR rep will be. You never know what their opinions might be about the party or about specific people in the party. And so I was very happy to hear that even when they asked me which party I was running for, that there was no, um, I don't want to use the word discrimination, but no, no judgment uh, of where I was running. Yeah, well, nowadays it's like tough to kind of get by as a person who's conservative. I mean, you know, companies like tend to go more the liberal uh, route. You know, they get these people that do the woke training seminars in case anything happens. They have something on paper to say, like, look, we, we, we trained our employees, you know. So, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I see that a lot on LinkedIn and it's slowly making its way into the business sector. I think the business sector was like the last um I guess you could say main pillar of our like society that that was infiltrated by wokeness just because, you know, media was probably the first one you have films and music that was, you know, shortly followed after and then it slowly makes its way into business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's I, I agree. I think it already has like a significant amount. Um, I just like it's not as in your face as, as it is with the, I mean, like you walk around on the streets to see like the brand. And how they do that but enough about that i want to ask you what do you think is the most challenging thing about uh politics like in your because i mean you haven't done it on the same level as you know like as someone as seasoned as mark barno but on your level <clears throat> and you know going beyond what do you think has been the most challenging thing for you i would say for me personally or like i guess you could say in politics today well, you could kind of mix it up for your experience in politics today because, I'm, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it would just be like basic communication because uh, people really don't want to listen. It's like they, they want to get their, their TikTok. They want to see their TikTok of whatever political opinion they're searching for. They get their opinion within a couple of seconds and then they don't really want to read beyond that or listen beyond that. You know, I, I, I often use this, um, this uh, example of one of the experiences that I had when I was running and... Um, I was on the corner of Sherbrooke and Cavendish, so like pretty NDG. 
Um, and this man came up to me and said, you're running for the conservatives. I was like, yes, sir. And he goes, um, you know, why do you support uh, white supremacy? And I was like, white supremacy, like as, as a Jew, me like supporting white supremacy, like, if I, and he's like, well, white supremacy has nothing to do with Judaism. I said, right after the black community, Jews are like number two on the white supremacists, like hit list. Like we're number two, you know? And so he goes, you know, it's, it's not, uh, it's very typical of you to bring in religion into white supremacy. I was like, I was like, I don't even know what discussion we're having anymore, but it's like, people will hear something of like maybe one conservative at a point in time 20 years ago that supported some white nationalists in the United States. And they'll go, well, that's the party of white nationalism now. And it's like, people really don't want to read, like even me, um, when the whole trucker thing was happening, right? A lot of liberals did not like the truckers, but there are a few liberals that did. I didn't label the liberals as the party that hated the truckers. I labeled Trudeau hating the truckers, maybe some of his main MPs that echoed his, his reasoning, sure. But there were a lot of um, liberal MPs that didn't comment on the trucker situation and um, even some that stood up for the truckers. Um, oh, I forget the liberal MP's name. I think his name was Lighthouse or something. It was uh, something like that. Um, he, he stood up for the truckers at the time and said that uh, Trudeau had been very divisive on, on the topic. But I think the biggest issue facing politics today is people not wanting to listen to the other side. And if they do listen to the other side, they get angry that it challenges their the peace of mind that they cr they've created for themselves. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I totally agree. I think um, we're at a stage though right now that you know with prices that are so high for gas, homes, rent, everything's getting very expensive. That we're kind of seeing a shift within politics where it's no longer. I mean, obviously the the social aspect, the social issues are there. Climate change and um, whatever you want to call it, I guess you could say racism, systemic race, these things that the, the, the left claims that are such huge issues right now. But I think people uh, at the moment are struggling to have their basic needs met. You know, you go to the gas station, you fill up a hundred dollars. Uh, that's like, half, that's your whole day for most people, you know, for someone who makes a, a, a regular job. So um, do you think that with everything going on, housing, inflation, the economy and, prices that you're going to see more people shift towards the other side towards the side that you're talking about so i think the issue was this like uh, the the liberal i want to say wokeism just we'll use that term for like maybe people that string off center left like past the center left line that really developed in the last i'd say five to six years and i think it happened because we're in a place where the economy we weren't in a recession we were in a growing economy, like pretty much coming out of the 2008 crisis. Um, and there was never really any warning signs after the 2008 crisis. So it was kind of like a piece of uh, a time of calm and peace for people. And what I think happened is people kind of forgot about the concept of scarcity and how it really has an impact on everybody. Because when things are growing, when the economy is growing and there's really no warning signs, people are like, yeah, you know, like, What's another 100 billion for this program? What's another 50 billion for that program? And, you know, while we're at it, like, let's let's just cut off fossil fuels and, and like, let's make a, an unrealistic goal for ourselves because the times are good. It's the time to make these commitments. And then we get to this point in time where even COVID aside, let's just say COVID was out of the picture. You know, stocks are at a crazy point in time. Uh, even now, I mean, the stocks have gone down in the last... I think three weeks to a month, but it's like, we're still at crazy highs. So all to bring it back to my point, which is that this, this sense of calm and peace grew among a lot of people. And I think they adopted this progressive mindset of like, well, look around us, there's nothing bad going on. Let's adopt these very progressive mindsets and ideas. And we'll worry about the problems if they come up. Well, now we're at the point where the problems are starting to manifest. And I think that people won't have a choice but to be brought back to reality and, and say, well, you know, maybe we do need fossil fuels for a little bit longer. Maybe we do need to focus on clean energy as opposed to cutting off energy. Um, and it's, there has to be that middle point of having a progressive mindset in the long term, but having a realis realistic mindset in the short term. So I think that a lot of people will naturally come back to um 
I want to say the center, but the real question is, is, is that center line shifted compared to five years ago? And that's something we're going to need to really see in these upcoming elections. Like the 2022 midterms in the States will be a very good tell as to where the center line is, because we're going to see where the independents end up. And then we're also going to see um, in future elections in Canada, uh, whether Pierre Polyev wins or Jean Charest wins or Patrick Brown, um, we're going to see where each of these center lines have shifted in Canada and the United States. Yeah, I, I don't think Jean Charest has the chance, to be honest. I mean, maybe some of the older people will vote for him because, like, I mean, he's known. But at the same time, he's known for corruption, too. So <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Listen, know. I, I, I see a picture of uh, Jean Charest's rallies, and all four people there look extremely happy. So you know what? It's, uh, it's whatever you want to make it out to be. <laughs> yeah, his wife, his daughter. And his yeah. <laughs> his neighbor. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, so, I mean, speaking of Pierre, what do you think of him? I mean, you've met him. You've uh, you've helped out with the campaign so far. Um, why don't you tell me a little bit about Pierre and, uh, you know, what you think about him? Well, I, just to start off, I think when the media is as rabid towards a candidate that's not even the leader yet, I think that says volume. Um, volumes about what he's doing. I think he's taking every position that needs to be taken. Um, you know, the truckers are not bad people. My, a very good friend of mine, who's an accountant as well, went to Ottawa. He was looking around. Actually, my friend is Jewish. He wanted to find the person with the Nazi flag. He was with a bunch of other Jewish people and he wanted to find the person with the Nazi flag. I don't want to say maybe what he was intending to do if he found the person with the Nazi flag, but his intention was to find him, and he walked around for quite a bit of time. He couldn't find anyone with a symbol of hate towards Jewish people, and he was trying to look for it. And then when you look on the media's perspective, it's like, well, this is a portion of the people that are attending the rally. So it's like we need to really take a comprehensive approach to how we see these situations, and I think Pierre is doing that. Pierre is saying let's condemn every single person that breaks the law, that blocks critical infrastructure, that, that behaves badly. But then let's also stand up for the rights of the truckers and Canadians that went to the rally that are just trying to stand up for their basic freedoms and their rights to choose. And so um, I think he's doing phenomenal on that front. I think he's also doing great things by saying he's going to defund the CBC. Uh, he's going to bar MPs from um, being able to participate in the WEF. Um it's just the list. He wants to increase uh, Canada's production to 400 million barrels of oil a day so that we can help Europe um, stop depending on Vladimir Putin's dictatorship uh, produced oil. Um, so I think he has a lot of great ideas. And at the end of the day, when you see liberals going after someone who's not even the leader yet, and you have the media doing the same, it's, it's almost music to our ears when we see that because usually they only do that when you're about to hit an election and you have no choice but to attack the other side. So if they're doing it this early, it's definitely showing that Pierre is doing something right. Mm -hmm. and, and I just want to ask, because you're in the game, you're in politics, um, do you think that there is hope or do you think that, because like there's a lot of conspiracy theories out right now that you know everything's being controlled by you know one organization or that um, you know everyone's corrupted. What do you think about that? When, because now we're seeing this massive movement towards Pierre, and do you think that it's possible for things to kind of go back to normal, like the Harper years? Yes, but it needs that, like, it needs that um, that seismic shift. We need to like completely reset and. Aaron O'Toole wasn't the reset button. Andrew Shear definitely wasn't the reset button. But Pierre might be that reset to kind of bring people to like what a government should be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Politics isn't easy. And anyone who attempts to make it look easy isn't doing it properly. And that's why Justin Trudeau is doing so bad at his mandate. Because he's only focusing on the easy topics that he can control from a Twitter perspective. He can control from a little clip uh, in the House of Commons. But he isn't focusing on the actual issues that are affecting Canadians. Like we, we should be building houses right now. We should be mandating companies that are on government contracts to, to be building houses. It, it, there should be a lot of things going on right now that are not happening. And 
Yeah, I think to answer your actual question, this is why I go, I go on tangents here. But uh, basically, Pierre needs to re- hit the reset button for all those people that voted liberal just because liberals were the safe option. If you give another safe option, everything else crumbles. And so um, I think right now, if you look at the polls between the conservatives and the liberals, I think the conservatives have the biggest lead currently that was not seen in an election cycle. Because usually uh, close to an election, people will be more hesitant in polls of who they will vote for, right? But then when there's no election, they kind of just pick their their safest pick and they'll like, you know, they'll brush off a poll. But uh, right now it's showing conservatives, I think, at a 5% lead minimum right now. And uh, that is usually the type of thing you see right before an election. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, especially young, among young people, like young men. And um, I, I feel like those are kind of the audience members that are getting drawn to Pierre at the moment because they feel like, you know, with all this stuff that's going on, they're being targeted and he's kind of a, a voice for the, the voiceless, maybe you can say. Oh, yeah, well, he's definitely a voice. Um, also, another little story is that a very good friend of mine, her brother is not into politics whatsoever, and she's not into politics. She came up to me the other day and she's like, you know that guy, Pierre, that you always um, advertise on your social media or share on social media? I'm like, yeah. It's like, well, he's not really into politics, but he finds the Pierre guy really cool and he has like a lot of cool ideas. So my parents, I and my brother, we're kind of just all thinking maybe we'll vote for him if he wins the leadership. And it's like, yeah. and I'm hearing that not only from liberal households, uh, I, another story is I went to the Pierre event yesterday. I saw, um, I, I believe like, so, you know, Charles, right? So yeah, um, yeah so ch- yeah. So Charles's family, from what I know, has always voted liberal. Um, and basically for the first time they were kind of questioning like where they might put their vote. Right. And so I think when you start seeing those people that have voted liberal so comfortably in the past, and now they're questioning themselves with somebody who's not even the leader yet, that is like the reset button that I'm talking about to really get those votes back that we lost since the Harper days. Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> I love Charles. I, I go to his house pretty often. And usually, I mean, back a year ago, there's always CNN on the TV. So I was like, oh, wait, you know, <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen. But um, I think uh, that it's, it's true. People are kind of starting to shift. The reset is happening. I mean, it wasn't the great reset that they were hoping for, uh, the liberals or whatever, but it is happening. And I mean, you know, I just think, for someone like you said, that's not very political, and that they did just kind of vote on you know a whim, like oh maybe I'll vote for Pierre because he's a cool guy. I think that's like a lot of people, you know, a lot of people that they just go to work, they don't want to think about politics because you know it's like already life is hard enough. They don't need to like add any more burden. So, well, I I, I yeah. So one one funny thing is. It doesn't take a lot of people, like it doesn't take a lot for people to swing their vote. And I'm going to try and find this uh, again. But back in like 2015, I think it was right when Trudeau ran the first time, they did like an exit polling thing. Like, why did you vote for the person that you did? And something like one out of nine women who voted in 2015 voted for Justin Trudeau because of physical attraction reasons. Whether it be like they liked his hair, whether it be they liked his smile, whether it be because they found him a calm talker there was some sort of attraction element to Justin Trudeau. And it's like, that was one in nine women in the country that if you were to flip all those women to a conservative, a vote, a conservative vote for another small reason, maybe uh, Harper would have won the election. So it's like, it doesn't take a lot to swing a huge population. And the millennials is a population that is very important. And Usually millennials, or at least for the last five, six years, millennials have been very liberal leaning. And I think Pierre, if he could even tap into it a little bit and and maybe get 20% of the vote from the millennials that he wouldn't have gotten otherwise, that could be a, a seismic shift uh, for, for ridings across the country. Well, I think a lot of the topics that he's tackling right now are um, focusing on the millennials and the Zoomers because it's all about housing. How are you going to afford something? You know, the back in the day you know the boomers used to say oh like you know our life was tough we had to make our life it, it like and i agree yeah it was tough because you know most of them came 
I don't know, second generation, first generation. My parents, they were first generation. So, uh, you know, it, it was tough to come, definitely. But at the same time, the land was theirs to pillage, you know? Everything yeah. was cheap. Uh, they could have bought in housing like at you know a fraction of the, at the price it is today, and that's a big issue if you want to own property. Otherwise, everyone's it's going to be a rent society where you're 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 sending your um, checks to BlackRock, you know, every month. So I don't. No, I, I I think we got to focus on this type of stuff. Well, yeah, and uh, I I asked Pierre. Uh, so I went to one of his first events that he's ever held um, as a like running for leader, and. 40 people. So it wasn't one of these crazy events that, that you see. And I asked him, I said, how are you going to get the millennials voting for you? Because as far as I'm concerned, that's the only way any conservative can win is you need to have the millennials. And he says, well, I'll put it very simple. Do you ever want to afford a home? If so, vote conservative. If not, keep on doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what? That's simple. It's to the point. And it, it actually is reality. It's not like a fear mongering tactic. And a lot of people say, oh, it is a fear mongering tactic. So, so I, I challenged them. I said, so go buy a home, put a down payment on a home today, take a variable interest rate because the, the interest rates are, are very low right now and they're not going to go that much higher, right? Take a variable interest rate, take a mortgage, go put a down payment on a house and you, you could go buy yourself a house, put your money where your mouth is. But I'll tell you something, if the interest rate increases by three points, goes up 3% and you're on a variable interest rate. If you have a house that's, if you're taking a half million dollar mortgage, which is very cheap, it's probably going to be around 700,000 now if you want a mortgage because prices are for the average home are around 850,000 right now. So let's just say you take 700,000 and you take a 3% change on 700,000. It's a lot of money. That's a lot of money and interest that you're going to be taking. And um, I think Pierre exposed it that we have over half of the mortgages in Canada are on a variable interest rate. So when the Bank of Canada keeps increasing these interest rates, it's hurting more than half of Canadians. How many of them are going to default on their mortgages? It's it's going to I, I just see this as a disaster situation. So um, obviously it's not uh, investor advice, but uh, I recommend to people hold on to your cash. Um, wait for the implosion to come because, you know, Justin Trudeau did put us in this position. So um, it, it is what it is, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, well, that's good because now prices are going to go down. We've already seen in Toronto, uh, the prices are starting. It's the first time I think in you know the last ten years, prices are starting to actually you know start slowing down. I don't know if it's going to slide down, you know, because you know we don't know yet. We we honestly don't know what's going to happen. But um, I think just going back to your point with the millennials and the Zoomers, I think a huge vote that Pierre should focus on. Because my thing with the conservatives is, you know, um, I always found it in like, listen, I'm not like <laughs> judging anybody, but it's always been white guys and it's hard for an immigrant to kind of appeal to that, you know? Yeah. Or it's like the reason why people are voting for Justin Trudeau is because he goes around, he wears the costumes, you know, he, he does, he, he's done, he goes to the events, whatever, you know? So it's like, oh, this guy relates to me. Add that with getting refugees in, you know, giving them a bunch of money every month. Um, you have that problem. And I'm not against refugees or anything like that. I just think that, you know, I sp I've spoken to a lot of people that are immigrants. I just say, like, look, you could be getting your two grand a month right now. But, you know, think about a long term because our, he's giving you a little bit of something right now. But you're not going to be able to afford a house in the future, you know. And it's like... Uh, it's it's a little short sighted, but at the same time, if someone's giving you that much cash, you're like, wow, like I'm gonna vote for him. So I think the conservatives really have to kind of do that too. They have to look at how they're gonna appeal to immigrants because that's a large portion of Toronto's population is immigrants. You know? No, I am I'm definitely with you there. And the one thing that I can say is that Pierre right now is working with a lot of immigrant communities, whether it be the Indian community here in Montreal. I know he's working closely with them. Um, but Pierre also, a lot of people don't know this, he's married to a, 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 a woman who came from, uh, well, migrated from Venezuela, right? So, you know, she and her family saw what life was like in Venezuela and came to Canada to decide, you know, that, uh, to become small business owners. I believe his wife's sister is a nurse. His wife's uh, brother is a in construction. 
um, you know, they made lives for themselves here. And I think Pierre understands the immigration mindset from his wife. You know, they both came from humble beginnings, Pierre included. Uh, Pierre was given up for adoption uh, from, from a single mother uh, when he was very, very young. Um, and he was adopted by two parents. I believe both were teachers. Um, you know, humble beginnings. And I think he understands what you're talking about in the sense of connecting with different communities that are a little different than his own. And, uh, you know, he has run campaigns in Ontario before, right? That's where he's won. It's not like he's this Albertan conservative that stayed in Alberta his whole life and has only been open to the Albertans. Um, he knows what it's like in Carleton to meet multi-diverse communities, and he's won with those people before. So I think expanding his appeal on a leadership platform, will, will he'll be able to do exactly that. Yeah, I think just getting them to engage a little more within politics and kind of seeing life outside. Because when you just come to the country, you want to get settled down. You want to make sure you have security first, which is, you know, what Trudeau has provided them. But it's just not a very long term security, in my opinion. So. Well, for sure, because like you can only create a an appearance for a group of people for so long. Like, so like you said, Trudeau's giving money to, you know, various immigrants, refugees when they get here, trying to make them feel like they have a great beginning here, but that won't change the fact that they'll never be able to afford a home. And if some can't afford a home, great. Maybe they made money somewhere else. Maybe uh, who knows what it may be, but you could only put that off for so long because at a certain point, what if your, your own country falls into a heavy recession? You're not going to be able to then focus on fixing your economy from like going into a possible depression and then at the same time appeal to those same communities that you were able to appeal to when the times were great. Yeah, for sure. Because when Trump was president, the economy was like, it was growing in every single way possible, whether it be GDP growth, whether it be unemployment rates hitting historic lows for both minority communities as well as white people. It's like everybody was benefiting. Immigrants were still coming in. Um, refugees were still being taken. Um, re deregulation of, of, of energy sectors. Um, it's just every possible metric that you could evaluate Trump's economy was great. And then Canada literally is just the domino effect of the United States. So whatever happens to the U.S. dollar in the United States will trickle onto the onto Canada. So we were riding some really great waves from the United States for a few years. And Trudeau inherited a great economy set up by the United States. And so obviously he was able to appeal to these communities, like you said, these immigrants that were coming in. He was able to expand refugees. He was able to expand the refugee program. But... What's going to happen when there's a looming recession in the shadows right now? And we're already over leveraged on many different things because we had to focus on COVID. So I'm very interested to see what, what will happen uh, if our economy starts to take that bit of a U-turn very shortly. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're seeing food shortages right now in countries um, that people are rising up against politicians. They're burning the politicians' houses. It's getting real out there, and I mean, we're lucky that we live in this society where we, we you know, we have a, an economy that can, you know, at least help us get through this. But it's going to get tough for a lot of people, and once it gets tough, they're not going to care if you wore a, like a hijab or whatever, like at some rally. So, I think uh, people are going to get real. But I'm just going to take a break for a second to talk to you about Stream Studio. Uh, Stream Studio is the platform we're doing this on right now, um, and so far, so good, Matthew. Oh, yeah, no, it's great. Honestly, uh, it's the first time I've seen this platform, but it was like very easy to navigate with and uh, it's working perfectly. Yeah, I mean, Stream Studio is like the perfect platform to do your podcast on. Um, I love it personally. I've done podcasts before without it on, you know, using different programs like GarageBand and, you know, setting up a camera. But the problem with doing that is that you always, um, you know, you, you're, you're never sure if something's recording on the microphone or on the camera, so it's tough. I've had bad experiences, and honestly, Stream Studio has centralized all that, and you know, it's been perfect so far. Um, Stream Studio is amazing. I, I use it for all these podcasts, and I mean, for right now, you could go on streams.studio.com. You could use the promo code Cheyenne Amiri. That's S 
H-A-Y-A-N-A-M-I-R-I. All you do is you put in your email and bada bing, bada boom, you get a code and there you go. You can start your podcast as easy as that. So don't wait. Go ahead. Go and start your podcast today. All right. So uh, <laughs> that was that. Um, okay. So we're talking about the United States a little bit. I want to ask you about that because I know you're a fellow uh, Florida man. So, you know, you like going back and forth. I love Florida. I mean, this year was the first time I went for the first time. Uh, the beginning of the year, I went for my friend's graduation. You know, Liam, he just graduated uh, from broadcast journalism. And, uh, you know, I, it was only a couple of days, but I really just, you know, coming out of this, you know, prison <laughs> that it was during the uh, winter, it, it felt like a fresh breath of air. And it's like, it really got me thinking, like, laws make a huge difference and they really affect the way you live and your mentality. I, I think Montreal personally, I think a lot of people who had to struggle with that, like I respect them and all that, but it's tough to keep your hopes up and have a good mental frame of mind. If you're, uh, if you're stuck there, you know, people, I mean, a lot of people, they, they become a shell of what, who they used to be struggling here. Um, but Florida, you know, it's, 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 it's great. And I hear the name DeSantis, 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 and I'm like, who's this guy, you know? So, you know, I looked into it and I mean, apparently this guy has brought the economy from, well, I mean, in cash reserves, I think from 7 billion, right? In 2019 or 2018 before COVID and then after COVID it's 20 billion. So how does that happen? Apparently by keeping your economy open. Oh yeah. I mean, it, it, it it's not only keeping the economy open, but it's just like, it's the way you run your finances at home. If you make $50,000 after tax, okay, um, you're not going to start spending $100,000 on your credit card or whatever it may be. It's just like it's common sense. Same thing with tax dollars and the way that you spend it. If you're making $20 billion of net, um, I don't know, after taxes, uh, net revenue from the state of Florida, you're not going to start spending 40 billion unless it's for the survival of Florida. So, I mean, the fact that he was able to run a surplus and create cash reserves of $20 billion, including COVID. And, you know, you can debate his COVID response all you want. Nobody got COVID right. I think the only people that got it right you can claim is New Zealand. New Zealand closed off their entire island of a country. And really, like, didn't let any people in or out. And if they did, it was, like, government officials and, and traders and stuff like that. Everyone else got it wrong. You know, Quebec had... You actually think they did it right, or is that according to Bill Gates that did it right? <laughs> no, no, but it's, like, I mean, did it right in the sense that if you want to strictly look at COVID response and nothing else, I, I guess you could technically say they did it right, but at the I, expense... Yeah, at the expense of people, like, because people, yeah. like... Uh... Yeah, I don't know if you know Izzy Adnesanya. Like, yeah, like, yeah. You hear what happened with him? Like, people were like coming into the gym. they like monitored. It, it, it was very tyrannical. So. If you oh yeah, I I don't get me wrong. I hate that crap. So like, I just mean if you're ignoring freedom, economy, like rights, and you're just looking at COVID response, New Zealand and Australia probably did that the best. But then that's not reality, though. Reality is COVID response economy, mental health, so many other factors that come into it. And I would say that maybe Florida wasn't the best on strictly the COVID response side, but when you take the, the totality of all those different metrics, mental health, economy, um, COVID response, um, you know, even migration uh, and um, like in the state of Florida, I believe, don't quote me on this, I think Florida is the number one state where most people were moving to from out of another state. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And, I think if you look at the Zillow and everything, it's the real estate in Florida has been booming out of all the states in, in the United States. Yeah, and I mean, that in of itself is an indicator of people wanting to live there. And if we're going to assess one variable that means more than anything else, it would probably be that. Because everybody knows what they're getting when they go to Florida. You can search up their death rate per capita, their case rate per capita. You can search up every metric you want to. 
and people decide for themselves. Free will is sometimes the biggest tell of a society's success. And when you have the state of Florida being one of the most, if not the most desirable place to live in the United States right now, then obviously there's something that's going on right. And one thing that I should mention is, you know, God forbid there's ever another disaster, uh, whether it be a hurricane, an earthquake, another pandemic or anything, Florida is building up the cash reserves necessary for that rainy day where they won't need to run deficits. They won't need to charge the taxpayer. The taxpayer would have already made their decisions by living in Florida, knowing that they're going to be protected by their government because their government ran surpluses. So it's like, or I mean, I don't know what the government of Florida will do. They can also do it in terms of tax credits. Maybe they'll reduce the surplus by $10 billion and they'll give it back to every state uh, taxpayer in the state of Florida. There's many ways you can go about it of how you want to deal with a surplus. Um, but at the end of the day, if people want to move there, then obviously the pros outweigh the cons. It's like as simple as that. So Ron DeSantis, I think, is probably one of the most successful governors um, in the United States right now. And um, he deserves all the credit. Well, yeah, I agree. Um, the, the thing is that, like, you're talking about the COVID deaths or whatever. I, yeah. I mean, I looked at a, um, what's it called? It's on the tip of my tongue. Uh, not a graph. It's statistics. I was looking at the statistics for that. And a lot of people were saying that, you know, the Democrats or slash the liberal policies of lockdowns, all these things were more effective than Florida. But if you look at the statistics, you see that Florida was placed 17th among the most deaths in the United States. And, you know, you got places like New Jersey, New York, Boston, all ahead of it, um, which kind of goes to show you that, you know, it's not it's not all as it seems. And the fact that Florida has one of the oldest populations in the United States, they call it heaven's waiting room for a reason, goes to show you that, yes, there's an older population here and, you know, the elderly unfortunately die. And um, there's nothing you can do about that. But also, I... I, I I think the most important thing about Florida's response was the focus on treatments rather than, you know, forcing people to get vaccinated. I got vaccinated. I'm sure you got vaccinated. Um, it's just not a lot of people want to like, you know, make that move because we don't know what's going to happen in the next couple of years. Hopefully nothing's going to happen, but like what, you know, it's the opposite of the Trudeau government when they forced the, the truckers to get vaccinated and um, you know, treatments were, were very effective over there. So I think that's a good point. For sure. And I mean, like you said, um, the state of Florida worked on, um, what are they called? Therapeutic treatments, right? Whether it be monoclonal antibodies, whether it be expanding their studies on ivermectin, which I think Joe Rogan got into a little bit. Um, Worse to you, Roman. <laughs> yeah. It's like, at least they were doing something else than the status quo. Yeah. And at least we know that they weren't jeopardizing people's lives doing so because I'm sure I don't have the data readily available. If we look at the amount of suicides and the amount of drug addictions that were on record in the last two years compared to the last four years, I'm sure we'll see spikes in a lot of states. And those states are responsible because they're the ones that didn't deal with their people's issues or they didn't encourage uh, living a fit lifestyle. They were the ones that closed the gyms. They were the ones that closed the schools. They are the ones that wanted open borders despite um, despite influxes of people that may have COVID. It's like there was very little logic from a lot of these states, a lot of contradicting logic. And in the end, Florida was one of the only ones that remained consistent from day one, where it's like, I mean, yes, they shut down at the very beginning when no one knew what was going on, like in I probably March and April and May. Uh, of 2020. But from then on out, they were like, we're keeping our economy open, mask up if you want to sort of thing. Um, if you're really concerned about your health, we're going to get you vaccinated very fast. Um, but then on out, like you decide your level of risk for your family, your friends, and that that will be it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I totally agree. Um, those are great points. The only thing I do not, you know, I mean, this is Kind of an issue i think conservatives are very quiet about and i think you know also some republicans a lot of people in our generation younger people we don't really care about you know what you do you know your, in your personal life or if you what orientation you are or whatever it is you know uh 
But I think the problem right now with you know guys like DeSantis and some other Republicans slash conservatives is the issue of abortion and you know the right for a woman to choose what they want to do with their body. Now I think it's important to say that obviously it's it's not the best idea to get an abortion like eight months into the pregnancy. Um, but at the same time, you know, like earlier on, if you want to get that, it should be your choice. So I want to know what your opinion on that is, because we don't hear too much about conservatives talking about that. So I'm, a, I'm in a weird place because technically I'm pro-choice, but I have pro-life sentiments. So in the sense, like you said, if it's early on where the science indicates that it's not a human being, I'm totally for any woman getting an abortion for any reason, right? It's where you start getting where the where the data starts getting fuzzy is where I personally have a little bit of an issue. Like when we start getting to like the 15 week mark where we can decide where we can actually tell that there is a heartbeat, there is a brain of like a, a, a brain that has cellular activity going on in it. Maybe we don't have thoughts because it's not developed yet. Um, but you have a, a brain with cellular activity. Um, you have a heartbeat and you have the ability for the baby to feel pain. That's usually around the 15 week mark and most scientific studies or medical schools will actually agree with all those three factors being pre uh, present. So for me, it's like after 15 weeks, I personally have an issue with it. Um, before 15 weeks, you can kind of do whatever you want sort of thing. Like that's like you can choose, but I just feel like the, the reason why it's becoming a heated topic is because our society has yet to adopt a line in the sand of what is considered a human and what is considered a fetus. And I don't have that answer. But what I'm saying is, is if society can come to that, that line in the sand of where life truly begins and where it could have maybe not all pro-lifers and not all pro-choicers agreeing to it, but the majority of both agreeing to it, I think there'd be a lot of an easier time going about it because majority of Canadians and Americans do agree that late term abortion should not be like readily and expandedly available to everybody. It's just nobody believes in the banning of abortion. Well, except the pro-lifers. So yeah. it's like to just, yeah, I don't have the answers. And my answer is like, let's just keep it the status quo as is in Canada, at least, because we're not going to be progressing our society by focusing on this. So there's a lot more pressing topics. Um, and it's just not really worth touching upon it. The United States with Roe v. Wade is, is completely different than Canada. You know, I've spoken to a few people that are in law. I've spoken to a few people that have studied American constitutional law. Um, Roe v. Wade has a lot of question marks of whether it was good law to begin with back in the 1970s. So I don't know enough about it, but what I will say is that if you look up the percentage of constitutional lawyers that agree with Roe v. Wade, it's way more skewed. Uh, it's like way more leveled, sorry, than if people just agree with abortion or not. Mm -hmm. Meaning that there's a reason why these constitutional lawyers are disagreeing with the public when it comes to Roe v. Wade. That's because maybe they know something that the general public doesn't about its law and its merit as a law. So in Canada, let's just not touch it. In the United States, um, if they, if let's just say the Supreme Court truly believes that Roe v. Wade should be overturned, then the states should be able to do what they want. But I, if I were a Republican senator, because I'd be a Republican way before I'd be a Democrat, um, I would offer money to to women that were affected to be able to either help with their upbringing of their child or to help them seek out of state abortions if they truly feel like that is their that is their want. Mm -hmm. That's that's good. That's good. So you incentivize them to either you know have a kid or to do it somewhere else. Exactly. So it's not the best answer. Technically I'm a pro choice person because I do believe in abortions up to a certain point, but uh, the pro lifers would not accept my position um, if I wanted to join their groups. But pro choicers would allow me to join their groups. So that's why I identify as pro choice. Don't you think that kind of takes away from the party, though? I mean, in these trying times with all these different issues, when it comes to something so, I don't know, I don't want to say backwards, but it's almost like this is like some Islamic type of situation. It's like, it's so, you know, we should be beyond this right now and talking about the real issues at hand. Why are we discussing something, you know, that should be, it's like these people, they, I mean, Republicans, 
they say like, oh, my body, my choice when it comes to the vaccine. But when it comes to like someone doing what they want with their body, it's a little bit, I don't know. It's, it, it, I mean, like, it's like, I want to, I want to be, you know, cheering them on, but it's, it's hard when, when we got this stuff going on at, at the same time, you know, I think it takes it, away a little bit. It's definitely a tricky thing, right? Because the pro-lifers, they say, it's not just your body, it's the baby's body too. So whatever you do with your body is affecting another body. Whereas with the vaccine, um, you could be affecting your own body. But then if you take the vaccine, if you don't get the vaccine, you could be affecting someone else walking across the street. It becomes so blurred as to like yeah. where you can stretch the goalposts of, of making your argument. But like for a lot of people, they think Roe v. Wade was just never supposed to be a law in the first place. It was just created um, and the Supreme Court in the 1970s had it backwards. That's what they believe. Um, in the 1970s, they didn't have good law. And it's finally being repealed because it was never supposed to be there in the first place. And the states know what's best for their individual people because the federal government won't know what's best for every particular state and what each state believes in. I guarantee you that the, the needs of the people in Kentucky are very different than the needs of the people in New York State. Um, and every state will technically make the best decision for themselves if Roe v. Wade is overturned. It's just, it's very sad and um, backwards for the women that live in these Republican-based states that would be affected if they did want to get an abortion. And that's where I feel like hopefully or outside organizations and democratic states can kind of step up to the plate and help those women in Republican-based states get their abortions if need be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, okay, so abortion is one issue. The other one is the environment. So the environment um, is obviously like a lot of, there's a lot of mixed opinions here, but, you know, and the establishment is saying that, oh, like, you know, there's a big climate crisis that's going on. Um, however, the conservative position is that, you know, it, it, we should focus on the economy and the environment, you know, should take kind of a step back. Like, I uh, agree I'm against big government because I know what big government does. It brings in, you know, a lot of laws, administration, and usually, you know, I mean, in states where big government is communism, it doesn't really, it's not in the best interest of the people. And at the moment right now, we're seeing a big shift for a push by, for big governments, like by NGOs, like you said, the uh, World Economic Forum, the WHO, who wants to do this pandemic treaty right now. Um, so how do we tackle this? without because you know once the government gets bigger the tax tax taxes go higher we're paying more money and we don't know where this money's going is it going for Trudeau to take vacation or you know we don't know so how do we tackle this issue um on a level that works for everybody and i mean it's tough to say like everything's going to be transparent but how would you tackle it if you were uh prime minister <laughs> Well, you know, Canada does only represent 3% of greenhouse gas emissions in the entire world. Even if you were to reduce that by a third, you're at 1%, right? You've only made a 2% overall contribution to reducing greenhouse gas emissions in all of Canada, uh, in the entire, on the entire planet. If you were to focus on a country like India, country like Bangladesh, China, um, where other based uh, production companies, uh, countries, um, Bangladesh, Pakistan, if you were to focus on a lot of these countries, you're going to, even if you shave off, I think China represents something like 15 to 19% of the greenhouse gas emissions in Canada, uh, in, on the planet. And then India represents slightly smaller. If you were to just chip away at a fifth of each India and China and Bangladesh, uh, and cut their greenhouse gas emissions, you're going to be tackling, you know, a fifth of let's just say 28%. So you're going to be at like 5.4%, give or take of the greenhouse gas emissions. That's over, that's almost three times. That's two and a half times what we would be able to do in Canada for the planet. So that's basically the conservative mindset for people that I've met. It's like, let's stop hyper-focusing on what Canadians can do today to help the planet. And let's focus on the people that are making up a huge part of the global's uh, greenhouse gas emissions production, right? So what I'm saying is this, in Canada, we have our initiatives, let's aim to have um, carbon-free vehicles, uh, you know, by a certain date, let's ban 
plastic straws. Sure. Like let's do our little parts here and there, but it's like, why can't we produce our oil? Why can't we produce our natural gas? Why can't we sell to Europe when countries like Russia, countries like Saudi Arabia are producing oil in the dirtiest and most harmful ways to our planet? And so Canada has some of the cleanest ways to produce oil and natural gas in the world or to, I guess you could say, to extract it. Like, um, I believe Pierre Polyev was the one who said this, that, and I didn't even know this. Canada has a carbon neutral way of producing natural gas in Canada right now. Like it's an actual carbon neutral production process. You think the Russians are carbon neutral when they're selling their natural gas to Europe? There's no way. So it's like, why are we the ones taking the hit? Why are Canadians the one taking the hit? Let's focus on helping the world's environment as opposed to Canada's environment. And then the global effect will be the same. So my, my, my echoing is just this. Let's focus on China. Let's focus on Bangladesh. Let's focus on Pakistan. Let's focus on China. Let's help them. Let's sell them our green technology. Let's gift them technology. You know, if, if we want to make a, a world impact, let's make a world impact. Like every, a lot of people are saying, oh, the conservatives got rated an F on their climate plan. It's like, yeah, because 80% of our things that we talk about in the climate plan are not related to Canada. So of course we're going to fail because the, the NDP and the Green Party talk about only Canada's part in the, in the puzzle. But Canada's part in the puzzle, we represent one piece when China, India, and all these people represent 10 pieces. So it's like, we just need to realign ourselves with the reality of the situation. Yes, Canada is not perfect. Maybe on a per capita footprint, we're not great. But even on a per capita footprint, where us not doing great is still microscopic compared to those countries that are just running wild with their carbon emissions. Yeah, I mean it's a tough, uh, it's tough to hold those countries accountable just based on you know them saying like you know they they have all the power in the sense that you know they're the ones contributing the uh, greenhouse gas emissions to the climate. So I, I think gifting would be a good idea. It's an interesting point. It's out of good faith, right? I mean, if, if you tell them saying, we were not, we're not going to charge you on this. All we ask is that you provide us with evidence that you're incorporating it and you're making an impact on your environment. Mm -hmm. That's all we ask in return. I'm just thinking, I'm trying to play devil's advocate from the perspective of, course. of, the, other, of the other, other country where I'm like, like, fuck you. I I'm not taking this gift, you know, like I'd rather, I'd rather do it my way. You know, how do we get them? How do we get a stubborn country to do what we want without you know, how do we well, it's, it's at a time like, yes, Canada and the U.S. may not have the, the best relationships with China, but the U.S. and Canada definitely have better relationships with India. Maybe it starts with India. Maybe it starts with getting Canada, England, United States, France and a bunch of countries together to talk to India and say, we want you to be the starting point of this revolutionary transformation for our planet's environment. And we, as a collective, want to gift you this technology as the leading countries in technology from around the world and help you transform your country from the ground up. And, you know, maybe then if that country is used as a model, maybe China in 10 years from now or eight years from now, maybe they won't be as negatively receptive to those ideas. And so some people say we don't even have five years. I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't believe any of that nonsense that the world's going to end in like nine years if we don't do something by in three months time. Like every predictor has been wrong. The world was supposed to end in 2012. The world was supposed to end in 2020. It's, it's been ending every year pretty much. Um, but I think if we just get one country on board and we prove to the other countries that it's possible, then I don't think they'd be as negatively receptive to it. A good point so what do you think about these um large organizations that are trying to rally all these countries together and do a one world solution to, to this type of thing it's uh, you know i i can i can start an organization tomorrow and say i want everybody on board we're going to save the world it's like you need to do one step at a time creating these one world organizations how are you going to get everybody on board how are you going to keep everybody accountable it's it's not realistic i think Every individual country should worry about themselves and maybe just a group of the most advanced countries should work with the countries that are making the biggest impact and help them get to where we need to be. Because like I said, if you just work, if China, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, 
those four countries, maybe Vietnam, if those countries were to just be helped by the leading countries in the world and they were to each decrease their carbon emissions by a fifth, it would be way more of an impact than what the United States and Canada is putting so much pressure on themselves to do in such a short period of time. You, you make some good points. You make some good points. Um, I, I got to take the second up again to just no problem. About Stream Studio. Stream Studio is a perfect platform to do your own podcast. I mean, it's so easy. You could be a grandma. You can be a child. You can be, you know, a homeless man on the street. All you got to do is have a computer. You go on stream.studio.com and bada bing, you put your email in and then you get a code on your email. You put that code in and bada bing, bada boom, you can start your own podcast. I personally love Stream Studio, the platform I'm using right now to use uh, this interview. So go out today, get Stream Studio. It's amazing. I love it. And uh, use the promo code Cheyenne Amiri, S-H-A-Y-A-N-A-M-I-R-I. So use that promo code and you can get yourself a sweet deal to start your podcast today. All right. Well, listen, I got one last question for you because I yes. feel like you've covered a lot. Um, so what's your vision of a good future when it comes to all this stuff? If you were going to be prime minister tomorrow, how would you go ahead and, you know, about like what do you think is the perfect place given the situation that we're in right now? How can we fix all of it without being too utopian? Realistic goals. So make sure people understand that having a difference of opinion is normal. You start it at the school level. You get in high school, you develop a class for everybody where a representative from the Conservative Party, the Bloc Québécois, the NDP, the Greens, the Liberals, they each come in for a week. They teach you their platforms and then kids get quizzed on what each platform stands for. Multiple choice style, make it a mandatory course for all grade 11 students or SAGEP 1 students. They need to understand what each party does and what each party's ideals are for. When you have a educated population that knows what they're voting for, I guarantee you that will be a best step for any country. So I think that's number one. Number two is um, like, well, that's meshed in with, you know, uh, allowing people to have differences of opinion because then they're going to be more educated. They're going to understand why their opinions are the way that they are. Number two is run your finances for your country the way that you'd run your finances at home. So I'm not talking to the irresponsible people that run up their credit cards uh, like crazy and then declare self-bankruptcy. I'm talking about the average Canadian, average American out there that sees how much money they make and they see how much money they spend and they always try to make sure that the money they spend is under what they make. Um, and that's number two. Number three is taking a firm stance um, on the environment in the sense of finding where the real impacts are hurting our environment and making realistic goals as opposed to these like let's retrofit every building with the green new deal by 2035 and this and that cars are going to be banned and that's not going to happen you have to have realistic goals for the environment and uh another one is just like let's learn from our mistakes covid was a mistake for almost every country on earth Let's, let's really study what went wrong. Let's really take the time to understand where society could have done better. And let's just not say, oh, well, we'll do better if, if, um, if it comes around again. We'll, we'll figure it out. Like, we really need to be a proactive society. I think proactiveness is, is one of the, the leading um, traits of success for any individual. And I think that applies to a country as well. So let's broaden the minds of Canadians and Americans. Let's take a realistic approach to the environment let's run our finances like you would your own personal finances and then um lastly but not least let's like learn from our mistakes and be proactive i think if you do those four things um it will definitely make society a better place and i don't think that's too much of a utopian based answer no it's realistic i like it it's good it's not yeah uh, asking for big changes <laughs> i like that thank you so much matthew um of course we, want, we can we can quickly go over Quebec or we could just uh, end it here if you got to go. Um, I do got to go, um, but uh, we'll do this another time and we'll, we'll cover all the, uh, the, the nastiness that goes on if you're an English speaking person in Quebec. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure. And thank you, uh, sir. Yeah. thanks for tuning in to the Cheyenne show, everybody. Take care. The Cheyenne show.